Lord, we just pray that we always uplift you and bring honor and glory to you, Lord. It's not about us, it's about you. And we pray, Lord, we put you first in everything we do. Amen. All we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What an awesome truth. Let's be seated. Uh, just quickly, we've got some uh, sign-up lists around the church. So uh, th this thought is not original with me, uh, but I want to read it to you. Read it to you this morning. In the church, every member is important. Okay. No member should be guilty of doing everything. Neither should any member be guilty of doing nothing. Every member should do something. So this is what I want you to pray about this week. Will you honor God by helping and serving in the nursery? Will you honor and serve God by helping with the church cleaning? Will you honor and serve God by helping with the Wednesday night meal? What you need to pray about is what the Lord would have you do to honor and serve Him. Now, uh, upcoming events. Next Saturday, right, Brother Derek, you have a, a youth event? Yes, we'll be going bowling. You're going to go bowling. Are you going to meet here, meet there? What's the plan? We're going to meet at Bogoy. You're going to meet at Bogoy. At what time? 12. 12 o'clock. So noon next Saturday, uh, Bridger is 9 and he goes. So uh, anybody 9 and up can meet uh, Brother Derek at Bogoy Lanes at noon and we will play a little uh, uh, bowling and just, just get together as, as kids and teens for the Lord, okay? Uh, the following Friday night, the 12th of May, uh, I've already found out my friend Katie is going to be out of town, but we're going to try to have uh, the singles that aren't in school. So if you are graduating high school and up, uh, military or otherwise, uh, we want to have you to the preacher's house, and we're going to have some games and food and such as that. So we want to invite uh, any of our singles and any of their friends, if you want to bring visitors, that's, that's quite all right. On the Saturday the 13th, we want to have the kids, again, from Bridger's age up, 9 and up, uh, here at the church about 10 a.m., and we have some uh, uh, door hangers, I'll call them, with gospel tracks and uh, something that I've done here, I've never done any, any place else before. If you pick up our little church invite, it's not really a tract. It just has in English and in German a little history of the church. Uh, and it, it says that our, our services are in English. If you need a German church, here's where one's at uh, uh, that preaches just like we do. Uh, but I have the verse on there, taste and see the Lord is good. And so each one of those door hangers has a little piece of candy in it. Uh, we're going to try to cover the village of Simbach next Saturday, the uh, 13th, and then we'll have hot dogs and such here at the church when we get back. You know, if they're going to come work for the Lord, we're going to try to bless them. And then this afternoon at 5 p.m., uh, the Women of the Word, we call it WOW, will meet at my house. I, Nathan and I will be elsewhere, but Denise and the ladies will be going through lies that women believe and the truth that sets them free. So... Uh, any woman of any age is welcome to come to that. Uh, a missions moment. It's been a little while since we've done one, and <clears throat> I saw some things this week that really um, I felt like I wanted to share with you. Okay? Um, we were sold a bill of goods today that our country was founded on racism and things of that nature. And if you know me, you know I'm, I'm no racist. Uh, but one of the Ivy League schools, Dartmouth, was started about seven years before we became a country. And their original motto was a voice fighting in the wilderness. That university is far from it today, but its um, primary purpose was to train Native Americans for the ministry. Most of those uh, colleges were most of what we would call the Ivy League colleges were started as preachers' colleges. Yale's uh, original model was light and truth. Lux of Veritas. Harvard was uh, Veritas Pro Christos at the Ecclesia, truth for Christ and his church. Uh, Brown University uh, was a Baptist school. I don't recall what their model was, but all these schools were started as, as uh, 
Bible conferences, okay? And so I saw a, a, a Baptist preacher, I don't uh, recall where the church is located, but it, it's Valleydale Baptist Church. And I want you to listen, okay? I want you to listen to what he has to say. If I can get there. I'm trying to. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to get it to the beginning of it. There's what I'm going to do right there. So I'm going to put this to the mic so you can hear it, okay? This is, he is quoting an atheist from Dalton. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. If 
I fall down, I'm going to get right up because I didn't start out to play. It's a battlefield, brother. It's not a recreation room. It's a fight. It's not a game. Run if you want to. Run if you will. But I'm in Christ's fight to save. The Philistine giant he shouted 40 days, send me a man to fight. The Israelites said, our hearts are brave, but our feet, they're full of fright. But then David showed up with only a pocket full of rocks, but he knew how to trust and pray. He said, if you're going to run Goliath, you better go now, because I came here to stay. The decree had been signed by the hand of the king, but Daniel still prayed to the Lord. The hungry lions waited in the den so deep. I hear the cups up for one roar. But if you've been standing anywhere close by, you'd have heard old Daniel say, You're talking about me, boys, you better give it up, because I came in here to stay. Now the boys wouldn't bow. The king got mad. He said, Turn the furnace up high. Tie them up and throw them in. The Hebrew rascal's gonna fry. But a little while later, when he looked inside, he heard my Savior say, Pull up a chair, boys, and warm your hands, cause I'm with you gonna stay. So run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. If I fall down, my Lord will pick me up, because I'm fighting to fight his way. It's a battlefield, brother, it's not a recreation room, it's a fight. It's not a game. Run if you want to. Run if you will. But I'm in Christ's fight to stay. The question is, are you? Because I can't answer that for you. I can't answer that for anybody. But if you're born again today, you are someone's best hope of missing hell and gaining hell. Hmm? Let's all stand and turn to number 435.
we call on him. We truly do need him every hour. And it's it's something to be thankful for when he points that out to us and brings us back to him. Number seven, we'll sing all three verses because this Amen. is one of my favorite hymns ever. Richard. 
just how important this is. We're on our eighth installment of Wake Up. Today's title, Wake Up, Hell is Real. Modern Christianity, we like to talk about God is love. And that is a true statement. But the same God of love is also a God of judgment. Christ himself talked twice as much about eternal punishment as he did about eternal reward. And so <clears throat> I want to go through a lot of that with you today. We will mostly read scriptures today. You are welcome to follow along or you are welcome to just ask me and I'll give you the references later. But there's one particular reference. Jesus is teaching in John chapter 5, and he says, They that have done good uh, shall come, that they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of the life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of the damnation, of damnation, of condemnation. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to turn to John 5 because we're going to go all over the place, okay? But we look at the whole of Scripture, we realize that we're not saved by works, okay? Uh, we're saved by the grace of God. That is taught over and over and over. And yet our actions are kind of a litmus test to if we know Christ. All right? So <clears throat> I, I try to go through this with you often. But in the event here this morning that you, you're questioning, and you said, well, I, I don't know if I know Christ. I mean, I, I'm not a Muslim and I'm not an atheist, so I consider myself a Christian. But if you've never been born again, you don't know Christ. You may know about Christ. To know Christ, there's five simple things you have to understand. I try to mention these five things every week. You have to understand first that God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, in whom? In Christ, the only begotten son of God. Those who believe in him won't perish. They'll have an everlasting life. But to really grasp that good news, we have to grasp the bad news. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, and that's talking about eternal separation from God in a place of torment that uh, we will see as we go further into the study today. So let's get back to the good news. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible says that for a good man, in Romans 5, 7, the Bible says for a good man, some one day or to die. I, I can't turn back the clock, but I honestly believe that if I had known on February the 9th, 1997, that my dad would go into eternity that day, I would have taken his place so that he could continue his ministry. Because he was a great man. But God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, sinners are enemies of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Exactly. And I hope I never get over the amazement that I fall into the us just like I fall into the whosoever. I can understand how he would die for so many, but he died for me. The same is true for you. As near as I understand things, approximately two-thirds of the world know that story. And yet the Bible says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. You see, it's not just about knowing the story of the historical Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus. The Bible says that the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him for Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. There has to be that, that point. So here's what happens when we preach on hell. Very often, if somebody is saved, they stop listening. If you're saved today, or if you think you might be saved, I want you to continue to listen. Remember the other day I preached, wake up. Everybody talking about Jesus doesn't know him, and everybody talking about heaven isn't going. 
right? I'm not here to judge you. I want the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us, is coming to the world to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. I don't have to tell somebody they need to be saved. That's the Holy Spirit's job. i got to lay out the truth before you. And that's what I try to set forth, or I am trying to set forth today. But this, this idea that somebody can know Christ and live in and of the world is foreign from Scripture. Oh, you might go there for a few days in rebellion, but if you're his, you're either going to come back or he's going to take you home. He's going to chasten you. The Bible says if we're in sin and we don't have the chastening hand of the Lord on our lives, that we are bastards and not sons. In other words, we're false believers. We're not truly conceived in Christ. We're not truly born again. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Tyler, I had talked to a fellow one time whose life, I won't, I won't give you the, 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 the specifics, but basically his life said to me he didn't know Christ. Everything about it. Everything about his actions, his attitudes, his words, etc. So I simply took him to that scripture and I said, well, if you know Christ, I, I can't see in your heart. I can't tell you that you do or don't. But if you know Christ, what's new? And sadly, he kicked me out of his home and the conversation was over. But I felt like I, I did what I was supposed to do. I pointed him to scripture. So as we look through the scriptures, there's a list that I've preached through a few times, and I want to just read it to you as quickly as I can today. All right? In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, at this point, the church at Corinth is a rebellious church. There's sin in the church, and, and Paul is trying to correct the church. And he says that I have written unto you, verse five, chapter 5, verse 11, I have written unto you not to company, don't hang out with, if any man, notice this, if any man that is called a brother. So if somebody says they're a Christian, and they're a fornicator, sexual sin, covetous, you want stuff that's not yours, idolater, worshiping something besides Christ, railer, somebody who's hateful with their mouth, drunkard or extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. So we don't hang out with them. We don't eat what we don't eat with them. Okay? If they're called a brother. You go to the very next chapter. In verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Don't fool yourself. Neither fornicators, uh, <coughs> idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. This encompasses all sexual sins from the transgender stuff to the to the sadomasochist stuff. To, to the zoology stuff that people get into. It's all covered right there. And it says, Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revivers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. If someone is born again, they cannot continue in that lifestyle. Uh, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, um, most of you know this. This comes right after Corinthians. If you can't keep those next five books or four books in order, God eats peas and cornbread. Galatians, peas, and Philippians, and Colossians. All right? Uh, go down to verse uh, 19. It says, The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. That's talking about sexual sin. Lasciviousness, sexual sin. Idolatry, witchcraft. That word is translated from a word where we get our word pharmacy. It encompasses not only these spells and things, uh, but it encompasses illicit drug use. Uh, uh, hate. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, oh, here it is again, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the times past, in other words, I've told you repeatedly, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Go forward a book, Ephesians chapter 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as your children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, uh, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. 
For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light Walk in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. You go to Colossians chapter 3. There's none, none of this in Philippians because they were all walking correctly. There's no condemnation of the church at Philippi. You go to uh, Colossians chapter 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For as ye are dead, ye are, your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is life shall appear, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, murder, kill, basically. Therefore, in your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. He's writing to believers. We shouldn't conduct ourselves. If we took the time to read in Revelation chapter 9, you would see that the problem is, now that's during the tribulation period, but all this judgment of God is falling on the earth at that point in time, and yet the Bible says that these people refuse to repent. I submit to you, that's the problem today. It's not that they can't help it, but they refuse to repent. What does repent mean? Repent means to turn from my own way to agree with God and walk in His way. To get on the same page with God about my sin. If you look in Revelation 21, 8, it's nearly the same list. It says it has their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you look in Revelation 22, verse 15, it's nearly the same list that are without, as in not in heaven. I, I, I repeat, this thing of Christians knowing Christ, but not having a changed life or a church home, is foreign to the Bible. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Corinth to check themselves to see if they were in the faith. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, you just told us that was a sinful and rebellious church. Yes, I did tell you that. But that was in 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, let me tell you what he said to them. In the same chapter, or a couple of chapters before, he tells them to examine themselves. This is what he says about the church in chapter 8. As ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he's saying, hey, you believe God, you talk about God, you know the scriptures, you're very diligent to live the scriptures, you love your fellow man, you need to do better with your giving. That's the only correction he has for them in 2 Corinthians, is to do better with your financial support of God's work. It's a pretty good church. And yet, he closes out the book with, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. You see, it's more than knowing about God. If we were to turn to, to Mark chapter 9, okay, this is one of those uh, scriptures that is very often twisted. We see the same teaching in Matthew chapter 18, but in Mark chapter 9, I'm going to start with about verse 44, I think. Uh, no, we're going to back up. Uh, to uh, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, he's talking about kids, uh, that, that believe in me, it is better for him, whom, the person that offended the little one, that a milestone were hanged by his neck and he were cast into the sea. So what are you saying? If I make a little kid mad, I should, I should be drowned? No. In this context, the word offend means to turn them out of the way. So if I take a little kid and I belittle their faith in Christ until they turn and quit talking about their faith in Christ, then Jesus said it would be better for me if I had been drowned. Okay? If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy foot offend thee, verse 45, cut it off. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. Now he's not teaching here that we should be maimed. What I want you to see is the teaching about hell. Because there's some teaching out here that, oh, you just go to hell and pay for your sins, and then you get to go on to heaven. Listen to what he says about hell in verse uh, 43. Go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. 
Verse 45, to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire that is not quenched. Verse 47, to be cast into hell, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one of you shall be salted with fire. What's being taught here is that we should avoid doing anything that would turn someone from their new life in Christ. In fact, I probably don't know the Lord if I'm doing that. Matthew chapter 25. Then shall he say, this is talking about a judgment at the end of the tribulation period. Then him shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but righteous into life eternal. we got to wake up. Hell is real. In Hebrews chapter 6, uh, it basically teaches us that the, the doctrine of Hell, or eternal punishment, is a very elementary thing that every believer should know. Let, listen to it, Hebrews 6, 22. And you'll see it's an elementary thing that all of us should grasp. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. He says, hey, that, that's foundational. We don't have to go back to that. Everybody knows that there's eternal judgment. we got to wake up. Hell is real. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, notice this phrase, and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What's the number one thing? They don't know God. Number two, it's hand in hand. They don't obey the gospel. Well, what's the gospel, Brother John? Jesus' very first sermon was repent. Remember, that's turn from my mindset to His mindset and believe the gospel. The gospel is defined for us in Scripture. Christ died for our sins. According to the scripture, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and he was seen. This was no fairy tale. There is more uh, historical proof of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection than any other event that's ever happened. More people that I can count have tried to study that, to disprove it, to end Christianity, and in the end, they become believers themselves because it is undeniable. He died for our sins. He was seen of the ladies. He was seen of Peter and John. He was seen of the twelve. He was seen of above 500 people. And the Bible tells us right there in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that over half of them, the greater part, at least 251, were still living when that book was written 30 some odd years later. It's real. Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the frog prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. See, here's the truth. Amen. Hell was not created for us. Hell was created for the devil. But those of us who refuse to choose God, have only one other choice, and that's Satan and eternal punishment. Wake up. It's real. And this is hard for a lot of Christians to believe, but I'm giving you straight from the scripture. A part of our worship in heaven will be to look at the suffering of those who didn't call on Christ. I read to you from scripture, Isaiah 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed me, for their worm shall not die, shall their, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be and abhorring unto all flesh. A part of our worship, I believe that is in the Millennium Kingdom, will be to look at those in torment who refuse to worship Christ. Daniel chapter 12. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time, 
At that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Israel, wake up. Jude 1.7 Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah, those inhabitants are now in hell. And that should be an example to us. You study a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah, you'll find out that right now our nation and many others kind of resemble it. That's right. It's about time to wake up. Uh-huh. It's real. Jude 1, 12. These are spots in your feast of charity. What are you talking about? There are people today who claim to be Christian who live the same lives as Sodom and Gomorrah live. I, I saw a, a lady say this week compared drag queens dancing in church to David dancing before the Almighty God. My friends, that's heresy. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame. Wandering stars, listen, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, wait a minute, preacher. You said over and over and over that the fire is not quenched. Hmm. The darker the flame, the hotter the fire. A black flame was produced 50 years ago. Wake up. It's real. You said, well, I'm born again. Hey, okay. Wake up. Hell is real. The atheist. That's the second video I played where an atheist says, how much do you have to hate me to not tell me about eternal life in Christ? Hmm? Revelation 14, 9. The third angel followed them. This is a description of the uh, tribulational period, which, as I understand the scriptures, I will be gone. But just, just listen to these three verses. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive uh, his mark in his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall, he, who? The person who doesn't worship God, the person who follows after the false doctrine, the person who follows after uh, the beast uh, during the tribulational period. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. In the presence of the Lamb, that's capitalized, it's talking about Jesus, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and who sort of receives the mark in his name. Notice, their punishment will come up before God through eternity. Hmm? Wake up. It's real. Revelation 20, 14, and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, death is separation. When you die physically, who you are is separated from your body. If we die the second death, who we are is separated from God forever in a place of torment. Verse 15, still in Revelation 20. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whose name's written in the book of life? Those people who have truly been born again. Hmm? Revelation 21 8, I alluded to it earlier, now I'm going to read it to you. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. So let's break it. Fearful. Afraid for whatever reason to call them up. Unbelieving. Obstinately unbelieving. Those people who take the scriptures and twist them to say something else. Those people, when you post a Bible verse, they post some kind of insult that you're cherry picking the Word of God. Obstinately unbelieving. Refuse to believe if you slap them in the face with the truth. Abominable. Well, what is that talking about, preacher? That word means hated. Homosexual. Transgender. Pedophiles, zoophiles. That's what he's talking about with that word, word right there. Murderers. We're not talking about soldiers. We're talking about those who are actually guilty of pre planned murder.
murderer, whoremongers, those involved in sexual sin. The word is translated from is simply pornos. So a lot of people today, they, they tell me that 9 out of 10 men in the United States look at pornographic material every week. And that, the, even more unbelievable to me, 3 out of 10 women do. You say it doesn't hurt anybody but me. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You get involved in that young person. It's not only going to, it's not only going to keep you from Christ if you're not careful. But it's going to ruin your upcoming marriage. It's going to ruin your relationship with whomever God puts into your life. You need to stay away from that mess. That is more of a sign of who's going to be in hell than it will be of anybody who's going to be in heaven. You're not saved by works. No, but if I'm saved, I should walk away from that stuff. Sorcerers. Again, the word is pharmacus. It means illicit drug use. It encompasses illicit... Why does illicit drug use? What's that got to do with sorcery? I hope you've never had a palm or it, but I have in my wild days at a party. The little blonde-headed girl read my palm. Everything she said came true. That's, that's wicked scary right there if you think about it. But she was also stoned out of her mind. And everything she said came true. See, I was all about sales and making money. She said, you're about to have a life-changing event. And your whole career is going to change. I got my with God. And now I've preached in 30 some odd states and several countries. And helped start four churches. Everything she said was true. If that messes up the devil. Don't play with it. Idolaters, worshippers of money, sex, fame, uh, whether it be a physical idol or something else. Sometimes we worship ourselves. All liars. Well, that doesn't really need an expl ex explanation, does it? Listen, people try to deny hell. I'm coming in for a rain, believe it or not. I might actually be done by 12. Y'all better put a red mark on the ceiling if I make it. <laughs> people say they don't believe in the afterlife. And then you ask them where they're going to go when they die. And people who just said they don't believe in the afterlife will tell you that they're going to heaven. Why is there so, so much confusion about afterlife? Why is there so much confusion about hell? Well, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who is the God of this world? That's a little g. Who is the God of this world? Little g God of this world. It's Satan. So he's blinded them. So what do you think Satan uses to blind people to the truth, the glories, the bright, the shining, the beautiful, good news of life in Christ Jesus? The presumption that you can be saved later? Hmm? No man knows what a day may bring forth, the proverb says in Proverbs 27. The participation in good works. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Look at all this good stuff I do, and they don't. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. Right. The presumption we can be saved later. The participation in good works. The practice of religion. Oh, but, but I do this, and I do that, and I do the other, and I, I burn this, and I read this. Hmm. I keep the commandments, preacher. I, well, first off, if you, if, if you say you keep the commandments, you're fooling yourself. But listen, we couldn't keep the commandments. That's why God provided another way. Right. The Bible says, of those who keep the commandments, in Romans chapter 3, now we know whatsoever things the law, that would be the Ten Commandments, right? It's actually 613 of them. It says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. When I look at the Ten Commandments, the first thing that comes to my mind, honestly, is thou shalt not steal. Because when I was five years old, I put my finger through a through a, a, a clear plastic bag at the at the wool co in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and pulled out a little bite-sized Milky Way and ate it on the way to the car. And my mama said, "What you What you eating?" I said, 
The microwave. Where did you get it? Oh, the bird. Well, this was the 70s. She whipped my tail in the parking lot, <laughs> and then we went into the store, and I had to go find a bag and put a hole in, confess to the manager that I had stolen it, and pay for it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I would buy a mama pay for it, but <laughs> the lesson I'm not it's been 50 years. I haven't forgotten. Come on. Mm -hmm. But what about honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long? Now, I gotta tell you, when I was rebellious, I didn't anything but honor my parents. The purpose of the law is to point us to Christ. That the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, the next verse says, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The practice of religion is not going to get you there. That's one thing that Satan uses to blind you. And finally, this is for me and you. You ready? Those of us who say that we know Christ. The pitiful lies of professing believers. In, in Ezekiel chapter 33, the Bible teaches us that God has set us as watchmen. Those are guards that blow the trumpet when the, when the enemy comes. The Bible says, if when he, the people out there, not the guard, oh no, no, if when the guard, the watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and taketh him away, but his blood's upon his own head. Right. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not the warning. You can't worry if they're going to get saved. What you have to do is blow the trumpet. But he that take it to warning shall deliver his soul. Some of them are going to be saved. Some of them are going to reject it. But listen to the but in verse 6. If the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his sin. In other words, they're not going to hell because of me. They're going to hell because they rejected Christ. But listen to the but. His blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Mm -hmm. See thou, O son of man, I have set thee. A watchman. Why you got that trumpet up there, preacher? Because mm -hmm. you and I are supposed to be blowing the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Bible says in Isaiah 58, 1, Cry aloud! Spare not! Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. <laughs> Trumpets have been used since the days of Abraham. Since if you're not a Bible believer, since the days of the Sumerians, they tell us when to get up. They tell us when to go to bed. They tell us mess call. They tell us to begin and end battles, to sound retreat for officers' calls. Trumpets, whether they be made of an animal horn or some metal trumpet like this one Brother Phil allowed me to use, they can be heard above the noise of war. My friends, there is a war going on right now all around us for the souls of men. The soul of a nation and God has commanded us to prayerfully take the gospel to every person of every people in every place in his power, his strength, on his power, his authority, with his passion. How do we take this gospel? By, repeat, by preaching repentance and remission of his in, excuse me, by remission of sins in his name. Amen. Wake up. Hell is real. Life is short. And Christ is coming. Hmm? For the believer, my question is to you today, are you blowing the trumpet? Or do you just like to come to church and praise him? It's a good thing to come to church and praise him. My devotional this morning that I put on all the different social media said, let's rock the rafters in song, shout, and sermon, glorifying the Savior. I don't care how loud you shout, how well you sing, or how well you sermonize, if you're not blowing the trumpet of the lost people around you, you're not in God's will. No, no. Hmm? Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you fish. So I hold one, so you ain't got to put a red cloth on it. If you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So let me give you the contrast to that. If you ain't following, if you ain't fishing, you ain't following as closely as you should be. We talked about that last week. I'm going to do something that I very seldom do. I'm going to ask every believer in the room who is truly.
truly concerned with it. But what my buddy James Self calls frangelism. That's evangelism to our friends, our relatives, our associates, and our neighbors. If you're born again this morning, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a home in heaven, I'm going to ask you to come up here and join me in praying that not just heritage, but every Bible preaching church in the land would get a vision that hell is real and Christ is coming. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I promise you I'll be standing at that back door in a minute and I'll be willing to talk to anybody. But right now, I am, and I'm fixing to get in this altar and pray. And I'm asking you, if you know Christ, if you're concerned about your friends and neighbors going to hell, that you'll join me and pray for God to work. as we go through this week, Lord, that you would take the blinders off of our eyes, Lord. Take away the, the cataracts and the, and the dim vision and let us see the burden that the people around us are under. Lord. Give us the gumption to give them the gospel, Lord, to, to, to live it before their eyes, but also to speak it into their ears. Lord, Lord I know that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. Trans, non-trans, drunkards, drug addicts, Lord, you died for all of us. Murderers, thieves, anything we can find a commandment against, Lord, we know you died for that, that person to be poor sinner. And Lord, we know our country is just, it's going down the drain and going down the drain rapidly. We need a move from the Almighty God. And I pray that you'd not only work in our little church, but I pray you'd work in the other churches around Germany and the other churches around the United States, Lord, the churches in Japan to reach Americans, the churches. Lord, just work in our little. Turn our country back to thee, Lord, one soul at a time. Lord, I pray that such a great revival would start as a result of us committing to serve you and to be faithful to give the gospel out, Lord, that if you carry if you carry your coming at 40 years from now, kids will be watching a movie about what you did in 2022. We know the Savior hadn't changed and sinners hadn't changed. Lord, help the saints to turn back to thee that we might be used of thee in this dark land we live in. Lord. We beg you again in wrath. Lord, as one prophet wrote, we beg you, turn our hearts to thee that we will be turned completely and wholeheartedly. You've given us your word to show us what's right, what's wrong, how to make it right, how to keep it right. Lord, help us to get in there and study it and so that we can just be funnels of your grace and mercy to the world around us. Lord, we pray all these things in the name above every name, the name of which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. I say again, I'll be standing in the back door in a minute and we will
seniors, but I'm going to actually turn to 545 and sing with me. We'll sing all three verses. 